and welcome to Digital Power China podcast hosted by the German Council on Foreign Relations. In this podcast, we bring together technical and China expertise for more autonomous and sovereign Europe. My name is Tim Rüdig. I'm a research fellow here at the German Council on Foreign Relations, and I'm very excited to be joined by two excellent colleagues, Christine Schokopfer, Professor of Contemporary China Studies at Trier University, and Sanne van der Loch, the Research Fellow with the Leiden Asia Center in the Netherlands. Thank you so much for joining. We will be discussing a new study um, that will be published uh, in January 2023, uh, in which both of our uh, guests today have uh, contributed and participated. And in this study, we try to unpack uh, strategic technological sovereignty of Europe. We differentiate here between four different dimensions, namely the resilience of supply chains, national security, technological competitiveness of Europe, and value differences that Europeans may have with China. We will look a bit into all of these four dimensions today, but with a focus on um, value differences, on ethical differences between both sites um, in Europe and in China, and look there specifically into the field of artificial intelligence. So let's get started. Christine, um, you are a professor of contemporary China studies at Tia University, as I mentioned, and you have been uh, doing a study Uh, that looks specifically into the ethical differences uh, on chi in the Chinese side and, and uh, the European side in the field of artificial intelligence. Could you maybe kick us off uh, in describing a bit those ethical differences and sort of that we have sort of a good basis uh, on which we can further develop our discussion today? Sure, it's a pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me and uh, to be able to discuss that topic today. I think it's very important to differentiate between the state level and the societal level, first of all. And I also wanted to emphasize, I don't think it's crucially a cultural difference or uh, cultural factors are at place. It's more about uh, systemic incentives, basically, which on the state level then, of course, trickle down impacting Chinese uh, designers or engineers. And here the fundamental difference is that the Chinese party state kind of sees national security and cyber sovereignty as an all-pervading governance principle, and that also has a strong impact on how it views ethics as part of the AI design process. For example, that leads to a much more state-centered and also collective approach, unlike the EU, for example, which, of course, puts a huge emphasis on individual rights and privacy rights, which interestingly, again, in the Chinese society, also linking it up with the latest protests in China, is also a value that is increasingly important to individual Chinese people, the value of their data, for example. So, but on a state level, I think this is probably the most important difference. And it's not about culture, it's really much more about the political system that kind of shapes the incentives for how AI is developed and used then. So I think there's obvious uh, value differences between Europe and China. Uh, and, and I mean, the, the normative differences and, and underlying implications, I think, uh, are very clear. Christine has already referred to some of those. And I, but I would like to bring uh, in you, Sana, and, and ask you a bit sort of, do you think that has beyond sort of this normative aspect, but do you think it has also implications for our technological competitiveness, how well we are positioned here in Europe? May that have sort of a negative implication because uh, European actors may simply not be allowed to do as much as, as the Chinese are due to ethical constraints? Or could it be a strength of Europe? We have a very clear normative uh, value set. What, what do you make sort of, of that in terms of our competitiveness? I think it could be a strength of Europe if we are able to put our values into action. And there I see every now and then difficulties. And actually this morning I read in the newspaper that France misses privacy who always uh, fought for privacy security in France has actually set up a company called Alternative. And apparently that company has checked uh, critiques and employees of big French companies. 
uh, secretly using um, available personal information. And apparently this company is even selling these services to authoritarian African uh, regimes, but also together with uh, weapon suppliers from Poland, from the Middle East. So we tend to think as Europe that um, we, we act differently as Chinese uh, companies would do, and that would give us uh, a competitive edge over other uh, companies. However, I think in potential, yes, if we would fulfill these European values as if we have them on paper, but I really think we have uh, some work to do there. I think there's uh, obviously here what Sana just referred to, uh, the difference between what we say and what we actually do. But maybe it has even sort of implications that go sort of beyond uh, questions of normative uh, frameworks and competitiveness, uh, because we are discussing a lot sort of uh, technological decoupling recently. And then if we have very different sort of general frameworks that may also sort of lead into specific regulations, the question also of course also arise, do these differences also fuel these ten tendencies of decoupling or, or at least let's put it uh, in more mild terms, this technological sort of disengagement? Justine, how do you sort of see this? Do you see any implications from, from this development uh, also sort of for technological disentanglement or uh, is this sort of a false uh, link that I'm, that I'm making up here? No, I, I definitely see a strong link here because those kind of value differences and the way they are also framed so on both sides, actually, uh, much more, although by the Chinese uh, side of things, uh, are kind of providing the narratives for this increasing polarization and bifurcation, I would say, of the geopolitical global landscape, right? We have this evolving two camps. So the US and Europe on the one hand side and then China slash Russia on the other side of things, so to say, we still do have fence sitters like countries who can act in between. And I think from the United States perspective, for example, what Europe still does in terms of providing, for example, um, uh, machinery for, for chip manufacturing to China is something which, of course, the US is not happy about. But I do believe, of course, also for companies, for example, before it was always about efficiency and costs. Those were the factors. But I think now it's much more to, to think about in terms of supply chain, uh, about uh, reliability or the risk to face third party sanctions, for example. So increasingly to build up supply chains, as we've been seeing this over time within your chem, so to say, within your uh, based on common narratives, based on at least uh, um, kind of theoretical uh, sharing of values is increasingly important and is increasingly also driving these two broader camps. Again, US, uh, you on the one hand side and then China slash Russia and other authoritarian regimes on the other side is increasingly also fueling into this uh, technological decoupling. Interesting. I mean, I, I want to sort of uh, have a follow up on that as well, because or combining the two uh, responses you've given, um, you mentioned sort of uh, the uh, the fact that this is uh, the sort of the differences between both sides are not necessarily or not primarily cultural, but really more related to structural issues of political regime. Um, now we're discussing sort of also these tendencies of technological uh, uh, decoupling and thereby also uh, different supply chains. Um, it, and, and that makes me sort of think uh, specifically a bit sort of about the actors and the drivers really behind that. Uh, I mean, you have differentiated between the, the society and, and politics before, but also like to bring in sort of a company level. What is the role actually of the corporate sector? Of, let's let's focus on here on China sort of in all this development. Are they simply sort of uh, uh, full uh, 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 implementing those political guidelines? Do they have uh, agency in themselves? How how do these companies actually fit into this picture? 
I think for quite some time, and probably still up until now, they of course do have an agency in all of this, because especially the, so to say, commercially orientated uh, companies, they of course also had leeway over the party state because they were bringing the expertise, the technology, the innovative aspect of things. Um, and of course, they are now also increasingly forced to rethink, for example, their global engagement, right? That has been a huge issue for companies like Huawei, which kind of got blocked in, in various markets because of their affiliation with the Chinese party state. And also for, for more commercially driven companies like Alibaba, I think they increasingly have to eventually then also, of course, uh, uh, listen to in the sense of the Chinese party state because overall they're still a Chinese company and the, the party state protected them also their their market there raised them in a sense to become a competitive global player but for them to provide cloud solutions globally um, will increasingly also depend on whether or not China is able to so to say keep those countries in their own camp uh, whether or not those countries have to basically decide they want to work with China or the US. Again, for the Europeans, uh, currently they're still a bit in between because some companies, and Sane knows a lot more about this than I, for example, in the Netherlands, which also provide this uh, machinery for, for chip production, they still can kind of uh, provide uh, to some extent machinery also or technology to China. But I think, again, from a Chinese side of things, they will increasingly also be caught in between their two two loyalties or their 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 effort to become a global player on the one hand on the other hand to be increasingly also restricted and forced to 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 become more uh, ccp driven company so to say to europe Sana, I would like to bring you in uh, here, sort of on on, on European uh, the European side. I mean, I think we, broadly, sort of speaking, uh, in the policy field, be that politicians, be that also political observers, I think we've been trusting also for a long time our own companies and our in the in in of inno innovation of European or Western companies, and thought that in a constrained authoritarian country like China. Uh, it is very hard to uh, become creative. It's very hard to become actually innovative. And in the last few years, we've kind of uh, been sort of woken up to a reality where China has become a uh, cutting edge and in, in some fields maybe has overtaken us. How do you think that we have sort of mentally already uh, understood? I mean, you have confronted us Europeans in your first response sort of with this uh, double uh, morality that on the one hand, we think we are great, but on the other hand, actually what we do may not always uh, meet the values that we proclaim. How is that sort of on the competitive side? Are we, are we sort of already mentally in that state where we have understood that China has actually achieved at least far more than we have, had ever expected? Yeah, it's actually quite strange that we thought um about the Chinese that in the first place, as if 1.3 billion people cannot be creative or innovative, as if we forgot about the whole past and, and all the innovations that actually came from China. But it's true, like also my colleague said, like it's, it's not cultural, it's more structural, of course, the, um, the difficulties for, for being innovative in China at the moment. Um, but I do think we kind of missed the announcement in 2015 by Li Keqiang, that China was about to move from a the factory of the world, of really a production side, to uh, a more innovative country that wanted to be leading in robotica, for example, and AI. And um, for a long time, that was really, we were, we were quite blind to that. Um, and still, I think the focus is too much on protecting our knowledge, our technology. And for example, that we, we set up all kinds of um, protectionist measurements for uh, Chinese investments uh, in Europe to protect China, uh, European technological companies. Um, but what we still do not really seem to see is that more and more Chinese companies are entering the European market on a fair basis. Um, and they are actually more 
um, advanced in some uh, technological aspects. For example, one, one aspect would be um, industrial cleaning robots, where you can see that. The main difference there is that uh, one of the most competitive European companies has about 10 robotic engineers, while their uh, Chinese competitor has more than 400 robotic engineers. So it's, it's, you can't keep up with that. And I think for too long, we really left it to the market. So we let European companies go to China for cheap production. But at this moment in time, we actually let European companies go to China for the innovations, like what we see, for example, in um, the automotive market. Lots of European um, auto, uh, car makers are now going to China for the innovations that take place there. So I really think we should be a bit more careful with leaving things to the market and be more, much more strategic. Great that you mentioned uh, the study on the uh, uh, on, on, on the cleaning robots because uh, to this uh, new report you have been uh, contributing to a chapter that uh, in a fascinating manner discusses sort of AI in automotive uh, and in the previous study that was also published by the Digital Power China project, you have indeed been delving in, into that uh, field of the cleaning robots. And may I ask, I mean, because uh, of course, what, what we try sort of uh, in, in our consortium is not just to uh, come up with great analytical pieces, but also to carve out what should be done about it. And I know you have, sort of quite thought provocative uh, ideas about what it implies for Europeans actually that China has surpassed us yeah, on, on, a, on a number of fields. Share a bit sort of what, 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 are your, what, are, what is your thinking? Uh, uh, how do we need to change sort of our perspective and our, also our action towards China? I think once we realize that in, in some of these sectors, we are not that competitive anymore and that are actually Chinese companies that are more advanced than our companies, then we should perhaps consider to only let those Chinese companies enter the European market. And not only Chinese companies, but in fact, every non-European company that would be more advanced than our tech companies to let them perhaps only enter our market in the form of a joint venture it would be quite similar to what the Chinese have been doing for, for some time. I, I noticed that when I mentioned this like one year, one and a half years ago, that um, people would not, would really not want to think in those lines. But now I do see a difference in thinking because we realize more and more that we are indeed less competitive at the moment and that we should rethink uh, our our openness, our open market, because an open market is great when your companies can compete with any company in the world. But if your companies are not that competitive anymore, which is actually what our African partners have been trying to explain us for a long time. Like, yes, we are for liberal democracies, but we're not that much into liberal economies because that's just not beneficial to our companies. I think we are going to, we are heading more into that direction as well as Europe. I think this is fascinating because it, it uh, shows that we can learn something both from, from China. So a uh, 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 look at Asia uh, may have uh, sort of very different uh, uh, connotations because we may not just sort of uh, teach uh, Asians, but we may also learn here from the Chinese, but interestingly also potentially from uh, some of the African experiences uh, and maybe we can relate to that. Cassine, I want to uh, sort of uh, turn it back to you with sort of maybe um, uh, one question on China and also one sort of uh, relating to, uh, to immediately to what Sana just said, maybe starting with the latter, um, because uh, I'm wondering sort of to what extent do you sort of see the recalibration of uh, European China policy changing us here in Europe? Uh, and, and what is your perception on that? Uh, can we be actually successful in sort of copy pasting ideas from China uh, or, or is maybe one of the greatest risks at this point that we actually to watch the Chinese uh, sort of too closely and think we can copy paste while our political economy is quite different. So we may need to, to adapt to the new situation but not necessarily adopt the Chinese practices. And related to that sort of, what extent do you think, uh, how do we have already an adequate grasp of sort of 
um, whether Chinese aspirations actually turn uh, into real results or are we still sort of conflating that to, to a large extent? So in, 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 in put differently, sort of how successful are the Chinese uh, really? How can we sort of properly assess that? I mean, Sana is certainly right. We have been overlooking sort of some of the ambitions and have not taken them serious enough. But at the same time, uh, it, it feels to me recently that we sometimes we make sort of the, the ambitions also take them for granted and China will sort of be uh, necessarily successful. What is your perception? Right, yeah, two very important questions, Tim. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, indeed, I think we should not, and I think that's also not what Sane meant when she was re referring to uh, making the European market, so to say, more resilient, uh, not copy-paste the Chinese model, so to say, right? We should not try to become more Chinese than the Chinese. Um, but, of course, there is also no contradiction on the one side to say, yeah, we're committed to be a market economy and our markets are open and um transparent and we count on the rule of law but i think the requirement so to see the so to say the scrutiny against chinese companies definitely have to increase quite a lot and i think there's also much more due diligence that we have to have to do also in terms of ideally uh, within the eu right in terms of really back checking are commercial driven companies really commercial driven companies what is their shareholder structure to what extent is the party state involved uh, and to really approach this with much more scrutiny uh, than before where we maybe sometimes would just tend to see the opportunity but now i think maybe a little bit more towards the other end of the spectrum to sense where are the risk where are the the dangerous, so to say, to to be become more much more tough on on that. On the other hand, I also do think that we should become more active in in fields where we haven't been active enough, but still could do more to uh, increase our competitiveness. Besides protecting our markets, one thing would be to become much more active in standard setting, also in the international standard setting bodies, because China has been put a lot of effort and also a lot of scientists and company representative to work. In those um, in those international um, standard setting bodies, and that's of course very much uh, a huge importance when you want to export your your technology, right? To really shape uh, global standards in AI, in, in quantum, in five, six G, uh, for example. And also uh, uh, another element would be compete for talent, because yes, on the one hand, as uh, Sana said, China has a pool, a larger pool potentially also, and good financial incentives oftentimes for researchers. Of course, that will be also become more of a constraint because of economic uh, crisis in, in China and then the lack probably of such generous budgets. But I think um, top AI researchers, for example, EU is still, according also to um, to a study by the excellent data center uh, for, for uh, digitization in, in Brussels, Europe has a really a competitive edge. And I think we also should do for example, in terms of green cards, talents, although, of course, again, with scrutiny from China, but to do much more also to keep our own talents and also talents from third parties to 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 really try to make it an, an, an inviting environment for them to do, do research here. I think that's also definitely what we should do. And to your second question, Tim, in terms of how successful are the Chinese or is China of course, that depends very much on the specific field of technology, right? Um, again, I think uh, we should be uh, aware of the Chinese ambitions and of some partially very successful, clearly in the terms of 5G, for example, this whole standalone systems that Huawei is, uh, is able to deploy, which uh, seemingly, from all what I keep hearing, are really a uh, top notch and 6G seemingly also is a field as China is going after and, and quantum. And of course, all these fields are kind of linked to AI uh, to some degree. But uh, also be aware exactly that those might be a specific, also market driven, applied kind of technologies, but on the more groundbreaking, fundamental, inno inno innovative part, I think there's also seemingly still quite a bit that Europe has a competitive advantage. And so we, I think that has to be a nuanced view. Uh, 
uh, neither kind of overestimating and kind of saying, oh, there's, they're way ahead of us. We can't do anything any longer. So we just need to cooperate. That would be the wrong conclusion, but also to really uh, take some of their efforts and their applications, facial recognition, for example, very, I mean, these applications, which could, could be also easily kind of improved in an incremental innovative cycle and, and bring to bring to the market to also recognize those uh, competitive edges. But, and I will stop here, sorry, just to jump to another field, which is of course also uh, partly related to AI in terms of deep learning and, and things, but, uh, the, the vaccine that China hasn't been able in the field of, you know, medical biology data research to come up with a really strong uh, vaccine currently, right? Uh, both in terms of design and production, which is, of course, also another field of uh, robotics and automatization of really exact, precise, clean production of those kind of vaccines. I mean, I think really, uh, and I hope you agree that uh, sort of China is uh, very often sort of competing really on scale. It may not be as efficient as we are, but uh, it has simply so many resources in terms of personnel, in terms of, of uh, resources, uh, uh, it build, builds large companies. So that may indeed be sort of an important uh, difference to understand for us, but, but also an important sort of trigger for China. Uh, I have sort of a final question here for you, Christine, maybe. I want to sort of circle back uh, also to the value differences here at the end. And sort of, because I mean, we are all using in, in Europe to some extent uh, Chinese applications that can be uh, video games, it can be TikTok. Uh, some of them are sort of more famous, others sort of less well known that actually there are Chinese owners behind it. To what extent do you sort of see the responsibility uh, uh, for that with consumers? Or do you think that uh, actually our state actors, state regulation is what we actually need to sort of cope with inherent risks? I think it should be clearly a multi-stakeholder approach. I mean, this is also, again, a strength of our system, I would say, the liberal dem democracy, right? That we're able in, in various uh, moments of transition to bring together different interests, uh, different stakeholders, but also clearly appeal and help, of course, also in terms of media literacy or technology literacy to help especially vulnerable uh, parts of the population like minors you, you mentioned TikTok Tim this is of course a huge issue for for young teenagers and uh, children in schools they are of course specifically the state or the educational institutions and other parts of civil society with the support of the state then should support those kind of educational uh, learning spaces to 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 recognize how, how those kind of apps work and also in research for example face plus plus by mac v a chinese company which is also involved into the uh, setup of the surveillance system in xinjiang i think simply a lot of colleagues in research are not aware that face plus plus is linked to that company so but i think yeah again we should not copy the chinese model the state is kind of paternalistically taking care of everything but to really again, play our strengths to involve um, various strata of the population and to activate, uh, you know, a, a responsible way of dealing with uh, technology. Again, we've seen in, in the case of China also the protest that uh, if you don't do this, then it creates, uh, creates a huge, so to say, social instability, or it also puts the state in a position where the whole weight, so to say, is, is on, on, on its shoulders. We are running out of time, but I want to ask you, uh, both of you, one more question, because uh, this is what our report is also all about. It's not just, as I mentioned, not just analytical, but we also try to provide concrete policy uh, advice. So, Sana, maybe starting with you, could both of you sort of name uh, one concrete policy recommendation that you think uh, European policymakers should implement at this very point in time, and maybe also indicate what you think this specific policy measure can actually achieve. Uh, besides investing in talent, like what Kristen already mentioned, which is very important, I do think that we should also realize what our strengths are in the relationship with China. And uh, looking at the automotive uh, sector, that is definitely that we have uh, companies like NXP, who uh, is one of the main suppliers of the chips for the automotive sector. 
And what we should then be careful about is that in these restrictions towards what do we export to China, um, that we um, cut China off from technology that we are advanced in, and that we then kind of force China to quickly innovate, innovate on this so that we actually lose, lose this, um, this advantage. So one of the things that we recommend is that we make sure that we keep China actually uh, dependent on the technologies that Europe still has an advantage in. So uh, if you would cut them off from that kind of technology, you would actually motivate them to, uh, to invest in that technology. So it, that would be one of our, our recommendations in this uh, report. We would recommend this because um, you would then you can kind of in general keep the relation with China in balance because there will also be certain factors where we will be dependent on China uh, even if we try to get certain production back to Europe we will stay dependent on China for quite a long time so that's why we think it's important to um, strengthen the kind of dependencies that China still has on Europe. Excellent, thank you so much, Sana. Christine, what would be your sort of core recommendation, uh, your one recommendation that uh, Europeans should implement now? I think to speed up the regulatory process of when it comes to specifically uh, ethical standards for AI, so to say the full uh, design and production and go to market uh, process. GDPR in many regards was great. I think the EU really kind of uh, signaled global leadership here um, and set important standards. But I think that could be, and there's also, of course, that's also what now, especially representatives from various industrial sectors are saying, it should be a bit more nuanced catering the specific needs of, of industry. So regulation, strong regulation with a strong uh, emphasis on protection of the individual and privacy, non-discrimination, dignity, really, but uh, also taking into account not kind of constraining too much of research, also of important research, which again would help us to innovate in the field of, of AI and how to deploy it. So a, more, a bit more balanced GDPR, uh, let, let, let me put it that way. Thank you so much. Well, at the end of this uh, episode, I have uh, a good uh, and uh, bad news for you. The good news is if you want to have a recommendation from me, then watch out for our uh, upcoming report. The bad news is it's not out yet. So wait, uh, watch out for January 2023. It will be out on www.djp.org. The report will be titled Europe Strategic Technology Autonomy from China, Assessing Foundational and Emerging Technologies. Uh, I think this was a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much to Christine and to Zana. And if you uh, agree with me, then watch out for the upcoming report. For now, thank you so much for listening and goodbye from Berlin.